Live from the Doodle Bar London. is the enemy. Understanding will never return to business as usual. We bring you the entrepreneurs, the thinkers, the doers, the doodlers and the comedians, all of whom are changing the business rules. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Renegade Economist! <laughs> this week's theme is no more business as usual. At Renegade Economist HQ, we are perplexed when we persistently hear politicians and business leaders endlessly talk in a way that implies that somehow we will eventually return to infinite economic growth and that will solve everything. What they're actually saying is by reflating one of the greatest credit bubbles in human history, we will return to an optimum market condition. Um, well, uh, you can ask a question about that. Is it feasible? No. Crazy? Yes, entirely. Uh, we wanted a different view to this mainstream lunacy, so a little later we'll be talking to the economist and leading author, Anne Pettifer. But before all that, let's look at some of the megatrends that are affecting the wider world with the Renegade Economist Index. Joining us this week are two men who, in their own way, encourage people to think differently about the things we often take for granted. John Gordillo is an independent filmmaker, television presenter and stand-up comedian. Agaman Monotero is a purveyor of all things cooperative. Aga co-founded a number of cooperatives, Brixton Energy, Repowering South London, as well as the Edible Bus Stop and the Edible Overground. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John and Aga. John, uh, to start with you, we thought that we had a look at some of your reviews, and frankly, uh, they're to die for. A lot of comedians would love them. This one, this. Gordillo is a thought-provoking <laughs> kitchen sink existentialist asking questions about personal and public politics. What the hell is a kitchen sink existentialist? <laughs> I don't understand it. I, I think it's because the things that I like, uh, I think, for whatever reason, the things that uh, interest me in my work start from a very small thing and they're always personal because the nightmare in stand-up is always trying to find a reason to talk about the thing. Well, it's perfect. You're in good company. Kierkegaard, so. Nietzsche, right. Dostoevsky, <laughs> Godillo. <laughs> I, go, I come from Liverpool um, and we have smashable bus stops. You made an edible bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> you talk me through it. Okay, so effectively it's all about um, coming together with your local community about uh, planting and food in like derelict areas, so uh, the bus stop outside the house was in Brixton, and um, it was this sort of, this patch of unused land, and um, the community all came together. I mean, I would not say I did it by myself. It was just, we all came together and started digging up plots, basically guerrilla gardening at first, and then saying, all right, let's just take this patch and make, use all things edible, and, um, and it just took off. You've both picked stories in the global media that either incense you, you find comic absurd, or inspire you. John, let's start with you. Well, I guess the big thing, obviously, is clearly Thatcher has happened. And there's a... I've got a wolf <laughs> whistle, which is... Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. I, hope, I don't know I anybody who's ever wolf whistled a dead Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I suppose what I found more interesting about it is, is, was the death parties that happened afterwards, the Thatcher death parties, which sound like some kind of heavy metal group in waiting. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I guess, I, guess I, w I mean, obviously, after, after, you know, clearly Thatcher died, there was, you know, there was loads of mass suicides in boardrooms around the country. Uh, <laughs> you know, people, people just kind of, you know, re resigned, and, and there was a massive U-turn by the government, and uh, Thatcherism basically ended. These would be the ideal conditions in which, under which to have a party. But I do think under any other condition, it just seems kind of petty and mean-spirited and kind of a vindication of her loveless, heartless values. Well, if, if, you, if you need an alibi to say the left right. are actually a bunch of loonies, you don't have to look very far. And it's a very, very small minority. I mean, I think you've got a photograph. We can see it now. A mate of mine, a comedian, was just going home and he was passing the Ritzy Brixton and he just, and he just shot this and this was on the, the night of the big party. I think the thing that we'll all absolutely <laughs> agree on here is that whichever films we're playing, they've done really well to get the anagram out of the <laughs> <laughs> and reshuffle it uh, to get yuppies out. Uh, unless they had their own pocket letters that they took with them. Uh, somebody said to me that they thought uh, part of it was a rallying call and just another thing for people to kind of protest around and come along, and it was part of the movement. But if we're celebrating this as a victory, the death of an 87-year-old woman 
if a, if a stroke beat us, I'm not sure how big a victory that really is. <laughs> Aga, you've got a different view of the money that was allocated uh, to Thatcher's funeral. What is it? Yeah, uh, they spent £10 million on her wedding, and they could have invested that into... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That inflation. Yes. <laughs> All right, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. But, they, but they spent 10 million quid, and, and yeah. you think it could be reinvested worth? Oh, if you put that into wind turbines, yeah. you could have, uh, let's say, 1.5 million people's energy for the next 20 years for free? Or a funeral. Or a funeral. Well, I tell you, though, the Thatcher supporters won't allow a wind farm anywhere near them. <laughs> <They're>, they absolutely <laughs> hate them. Not in my backyard. <laughs> what inspires you, or what has inspired you over the last... You know, months, years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ecuador has put forward um, into their constitution the right of nature. So on behalf of the uh, country you can, recognize the ecosystem and pos possesses inalienable and fundamental rights to exist and flourish. Um, and they called it Pachacama. And so all of South America is really coming together under this. I mean, whether you, you talk about the different leaders that have, have done that, but they've really come together and, and recognize what we can do. And doing that has stopped a lot of the big oil companies and interests, um, as well as multinational corporations selling milk and water. And so that, to me, is really inspiring for you know, whole countries to focus on. And we get so, I don't know, Amerocentric or Eurocentric. And, and I think there's a lot of really great stuff coming out of, uh, of, of South America. Yeah. It's wonderful. All right, so as we uh, conclude this bit, um, what's been plain comic absurd? What has been, I mean, <laughs> we've had plain comic absurd, but what have been those things that you've thought, hang on, this isn't happening in the 21st century, is it? I, I, there was something that in your film that I saw which I thought was really interesting when you talked about, <clears throat> and you pushed it really relentlessly in your film in a way that I'd not heard before, where you talked about how there's such a thing as productive wealth and unproductive wealth. You talk about banking and financing as this key center of unproductive, useless wealth, unearned wealth. And that idea, for whatever reason, just hit me last week. And I saw a picture in the Evening Standard, um, and it was of guitarist Ronnie Wood right. and his uh, wife, who's 31 years younger than him. That, to me, is unearned wealth right there. But, ha but hang on, let me just stop you, because well, I just say this. I feel like I'm just getting going on this. Yeah, I really no, I don't. <laughs> Which is why I'm trying to stop you. I, I just say that uh, unearned wealth, but he did write and perform a lot of he's the songs. He's not Mick or Keith, mate. Let's get it into perspective. <laughs> he's, not, he's not. He's a session musician who got lucky, and the only reason we know his name is because they've been around 50 fucking years. That's obviously about money. That yeah. tells me that there's no age barrier. There's just a money barrier. <laughs> that, that's all that tells me. And John, kitchen, go ahead. kitchen sink existentialism. Existentially. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Aga, uh, lastly from you, inspirational or um, comic absurd? Uh, the comic absurd is that we still sit here chatting about things um, with a corporate system that's uh, eating up everything right. in front of our faces. Right. So what's the solution? Effectively, if we come together in cooperatives which are outperforming, in, for instance, in the UK, um, the uh, economy by four or five times, um, where you have engagement of local people to own and maintain their companies um, and have a share, equal shares, one vote, one share. And you generate, let's say you build houses, housing associations or um, energy cooperatives, yes. which are growing in this country and, and in Germany and in Spain. You come together and then you own it. I mean, in Germany, 60% of the wind turbines and renewable energy are owned by the people, whereas in the UK, individuals and cooperatives only own 10%. There's a huge Im amount of uh, will to do that when you engage people, when you allow them to be a part of that. If you stop and you lock people out and say, we can't do it. I mean, the arguments through all these current affairs thing is, oh, it doesn't work. And then once it does work, they take it all in-house and try to take all the money out of it. So if you allow people to cooperatively own their own futures, be a part of it and own it and have equal share, not the one with the, um, not you, sorry, not the one who has infinitely more, I was pointing to the poster that was there before, that has infinitely more money, has more say in the relationship. Fine, but I understand that. Are you saying that cooperatives are an uh, antidote to predatory capitalism? Is that, is that your view? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's not that simple and probably there will, if it did move over to being more cooperative in nature and it wasn't just turned into a charitable rap, um, I think we would still have 
it would be a solution and it would probably have to morph in the future, but you know, partnerships and cooperatives are a real uh, viable alternative. Perfect. Guys, thank you both for coming in. Thanks for sharing it. But please stay with us for the duration and stay involved. <laughs> I, I, I don't need to encourage you, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, because we've got loads coming up, and of course, I'm about to fall here a bit later. Cool. But thanks very much for the index and, uh, and your thank thoughts. You, right. John and I go, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you what uh, we've been reading at Renegade Economist HQ. Uh, we'll start with this. This is Oliver James's new book. Uh, he identifies three personality types um, that many of you might have encountered. They are the psychopath, the Machiavelli, and the narcissist. Um, and uh, you, that's a laugh of recognition, I think. Um, and uh, he describes their impact on the culture of the modern workplace, outlining their behavior and suggesting how best to deal with them. Basically, it's a survival guide for the toxic workplace. Um, and my suggestion is leave the toxic workplace um, <laughs> and set up your own non-toxic business. That's an idea, isn't it? Cooperatively. I guess. Um, the second book uh, here is The Blueprint by Mark Braun. It's a novel, um, and it's his debut novel, in fact, um, and it works on a couple of levels. It's a political thriller full of intrigue, suspense, but it's a page-turner, especially as it reaches its uh, conclusion. Uh, but it's a work of fiction, and you know that because it imagines politicians who show leadership. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, hang on. Uh, and conviction. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, they're the books that we've been reading. We've found them inspiring and we recommend them. Uh, a couple of tweets uh, that we've loved or have just made us laugh over the last few weeks. Loudmouth Man says, uh, due to the cost of printer ink, it's now cheaper to fly than print your airline tickets at home. <laughs> <laughs> that, got, that got three claps. That, that was a three clap tweet. Um, George Osborne. Uh, yeah. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, he's the British Chancellor. And for those British people who don't know, he's the British Chancellor. <laughs> um, he says on Twitter, um, it's pretty fast and furious out here on Twitter. Yes, it is, George. <laughs> also, fast and furious in the real economy. Mm. Um, <laughs> Michael Spencer says, and he's a Mr. Michael Spencer, he says, um, Odd how politicians say, let me be clear on this, and then go on to say something along the lines of fiscal kite, wombat, umbrella, orange, coffee flapping badger. <laughs> Lionel Richie tweeted, uh, he's at Lionel, and he just said hello. <laughs> uh, that's it for the books and tweets this week. So after this short break, we'll be back to speak with economist, leading author and reformer Anne Pettifor on where the global economy is headed and why she thinks there's an alternative approach to our current economic malaise. Welcome back to the Renegade Economist talk show. I'm Ross Ashcroft. In a moment, we'll be speaking with economist Anne Pettifor, but first, it's time to reassess some of those unexamined assumptions much loved by mainstream business, economics, and politics. This section of the show is named in uh, honor of the former US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, and it's called Things We Didn't Know We Didn't Know. <laughs> After Japan's last decade, the American subprime crisis, China's real estate bubble, Australia's massively overvalued house prices, and the British government artificially propping the UK housing market up in a vain attempt to mask a triple dip recession, one could safely make the claim that land speculation, well, it derails every economy. What have the political class done to solve this predicament? Well, you guessed it, more of the same. They're desperate to reflate the housing market so we can return to, and I quote, business as usual. Our question is simple. Is this wise? Here's a different view. Within the Anglo-American property-owning democracy, the homeowner became a captive voter, but more importantly, a consumer. Lulled into the irrational belief that we can get something for nothing, millions bought the property dream, and almost everyone stopped saving for a rainy day when bankers and economists claimed ever-increasing house prices would pay for everything. Infatuated by this insane belief, people borrowed massively to buy dream homes, 
and build speculative property portfolios, whilst government, real estate agents and banks made billions out of transactions because house prices could forever go only in one direction. Everyone spent this free money, but without a moral compass to question the rights and wrongs of taking it or where society was headed, thousands of people stopped going to work and sat at home looking for more speculation opportunities. Pandering to speculators, populist governments reshaped taxation to favor predators in search of rental spoils and penalized the productive minority who produced actual wealth by going to work. Our next guest is a director at Prime Economics and a fellow at the New Economics Foundation in London. She co-authored the Green New Deal and back in 2003 predicted an Anglo-American debt deflationary crisis. A decade later, ladies and gentlemen, she was right. Please welcome Anne Pettifor. <laughs> And thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. Um, uh, just tell me, when you made that prediction in 2003 that the West is going to end up in 2013 in the state that it's in at the moment, in mm -hmm. fact the world, generally the West, what was the reaction? Uh, dead silence, really. I mean, the New Statesmen were really good. They put it on their front cover and they ran the story. But it felt like a dead stone, really. And people thought, oh, well, you know, another kind of crazy trying to rock the boat when everything's going so well. But having said that, there were a lot of people who thought that too and who were speculating on a fall. And there were a lot of pension fund managers who were very, very worried and who wanted to get out of the market. But I don't know if you remember um, a banker saying, when the music plays, you've got to keep dancing. And so they kept dancing. I mean, to be fair, I could see it was going to blow up. But what I didn't get right was when. I mean, it was in 2003. I had to wait four long years before it blew up. So what allowed you to see that we were on the wrong <coughs> track? And what allowed, uh, or didn't allow, n the neoclassical economists, your you know, nemesis, if you like, yeah. um, uh, what didn't allow them to see what was going on? I was working in Africa, uh, Latin America, and in Asia with very poor countries that had got into terrible debt and who we're suffering, you know, everything that's going happening in Greece, Cyprus, and Spain at the moment. Um, but nobody really cared too much about it because it was so marginal to the economy. But I, uh, so I led a campaign which resulted in $100 billion of debt being written off for about 35 countries, which is quite nice. And in 2000, I sort of semi-retired to the New Economics Foundation. And I thought, I just couldn't understand why this had happened. And everybody blamed OPEC and the oil crisis of 1973. It didn't make sense to me. And then I began to look at the global financial system and the architecture. And I sort of read an awful lot and wrote an awful lot. And suddenly I looked up and I, excuse me, uh, I was going to swear. You're not allowed to swear on this program, are you? And but anyway, and I, you did, can do what I, you did, like. I did say it. I did say, fuck me, you know. Look at that huge debt bubble out there, that Anglo American bubble. It's like n this little thing here, these African countries and their debt, it's so tiny. What are we worried about them <coughs> for? What's coming over the hill is much worse and much bigger. This is a massive blind spot for the finance sector. Um, I'm having big arguments with my friend on the left who are talking about the declining rate of profit of capitalism. You know, I, I don't, just don't understand it. And about capitalists going on strike. And none of them are talking about bankers or the financial system or the monetary system. And, and professional economists are the same. Professor von Rienen at the London School of Economics has just done an analysis of, of the Thatcher legacy. And he talks about it in terms of the physical, tangible economy that you and I can see. But he doesn't talk about it in terms of the financial liberalization that happened, admittedly not only under Mrs. Thatcher, because actually it happened, Nixon was a sort of precursor of all this, really, and the breakdown of the Bretton Woods in <coughs> 71. But that financial liberalization, which led to the easy credit, which inflated the bubbles, the housing bubble uh, out there, um, people have got a complete blind spot for it. And so if you do have a blind spot for that, you can't analyze what's going to happen because you can't see it. You're not, you're not looking at it. You know? And I think it's difficult not to be conspiratorial about that. I don't want to be conspiratorial about that. Go you know, on. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what have the bankers done to blind us to their activities? 
What have they done that we don't see them in our, in our lectures in, on economics? Where they're not included in books. Do you know, what have the bankers done so that in every economics textbook, there are chapters and chapters on inflation? Now, creditors hate inflation because inflation erodes the value of your asset, i.e. of debt. There is nothing on deflation. And deflation is devastating for, for businesses, for individuals, for firms, for, for people, you know, because that's, ask the Japanese. You know. How do you get to people to think differently or look at different aspects of the economy as you have? I, just, I think it's hard, especially if you don't have millions of bucks, you know, um, to, to finance this. I have to say the most exciting <coughs> thing that's happened, when, when we started Jubilee 2000, about how to cancel the debt of the poorest countries, the internet had just got going, and uh, but we were still sort of trying to email, or we were still trying to mail, sorry, our colleagues in Africa, and that, and that didn't work. You know, you couldn't send anything by fax or post, and you couldn't telephone. And then we, then the internet arrived, and you could suddenly, you started to be able to reach people in Nigeria. Well, today the web is just amazing for that. You know, we ha now have a resource with which to democratize knowledge. And it's a massive thing, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna try and clamp down on it soon. So yeah, so I just think, and when we started with the Jubilee 2000, when I was hired to say, you know, the, the people who hired me said, look, you know, we've got a problem. All these poor countries got massive debts. We'd like you to go out and go to, that, go to Washington and persuade <coughs> the IMF and the World Bank that they had to cancel these debts. And I said, look, you know, I'm a pretty powerful cookie, but I don't think I can do that. <laughs> And they said, why not? And I said, well, you, you can't do that because, you know, the IMF and the World Bank, they're just civil servants. We've got to change the minds of the real decision makers who are the G8. And I said, you can't do that without a public campaign on it. And they said, oh, you can't possibly do a public campaign on sovereign debt. It's frightfully difficult, you know, multilateral, bilateral debt, commercial debt, net present value of debt. You know, you can't expect plebs to understand that. And I said, well, actually, I don't agree. And um, in 98, we got 100,000 people turned up when the G8 arrived in Birmingham and Clinton was there. And they knew what was going on. You know. and, we, and the Treasury, I remember the Treasury coming to me and saying, what the hell's going on here? He said, you know, because cause women who'd, who'd just listened to talks, who'd heard about it on the grapevine, started writing letters to the Treasury saying, you know, we know that you're planning to cancel Uganda's debt, but the, you know, the cutoff date that you've chosen is 1981. And why have you chosen this cutoff date? This is, so said, where, where do they get this from? How do they know this? You know, and the letters would arrive on pink paper with little bunches of red roses in the corner. <laughs> you know, so what, you, what happened was just by talking about and educating, ordinary people got it. And once they got it, you didn't have to do anything. Kind of was in here. They were mad as hell. And they went out and, and, and acted, you know. And $100 billion got cancelled. So I'm a great believer in educating people, informing them, getting it right, getting it factually correct, and then leaving it to them. Well, we've got a perfect audience here for that. And obviously, at home, you've just mentioned debt. About, and, and there's this constant debate, uh, generally in the world, mm -hmm. about public debt and private debt. Right. And everyone keeps looking at public debt. It's yeah, public yeah. debt. It's public debt. Yeah. This is mantra. Yeah. What's the difference? And talk us through it. Well, it's a huge con, this. It's the biggest con of all, really. I mean, if you take the British economy, 70% of uh, our debt, our public debt, is 70% of GDP. The private debt is about 500 to 600% of GDP. We don't really know. It's hard to actually work it out. Now, that private debt is what's stopping the recovery. But the biggest debtors of all are the banks. You know, the banks have got enormous amounts of debt and, and they're pretending that this debt is going to be repaid at some point, that Mrs. Jones who took out that mortgage is going to pay back her mortgage in 30 years' time or whenever. She, and Mrs. Jones, meantime, is losing her job because she works in the public sector. So we all know that those assets aren't for real. So they are effectively insolvent. So this private debt is the, much the bigger problem. What's the solution, very quickly? So this audience can go home and start writing letters. The big <laughs> Stiff the, letters. The big solution is that here in Britain we're very fortunate because we have a central bank that can create money to finance recovery and only the government can stimulate recovery right mm -hmm. now. 
the Eurozone is in deep trouble because it doesn't have a central bank that works for the people. It has a central bank that works for the banking system. So what would you do? You're the governor of the Bank of England. Congratulations. I would basically, I would create, uh, I would do quantitative easing, but instead of giving it to bankers to go and speculate with, I would give it to uh, the Treasury. I would watch it very carefully. I'm very happy for private banks to be uh, kind of conduits for it as well so that we can keep a good eye on how it's spent. And then it has to be invested in the kind of things that we were talking about earlier that we need to address the biggest threat that faces us, which is climate change. Aga, if you were um, starting a cooperative and Anne was the governor of the Bank of England, I reckon you get on quite well. <laughs> and I reckon she'd give you about 45 million quid. Yeah. No, I'd give him 4.5 billion. Yeah, I mean, if, hang on. That's I'll, what he I, needs. Where's my percentage? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so broken. Hinkley, oh, the, effectively what's happening right now is they're going to give 14 billion pounds, right? And, if, and they say they're going to have 5 million people will have um, energy that will supply 5 million people. If you just broke that up, you could give each one of them 3 million. I think they would prefer that. Effectively, cooperatives are uh, energy, renewable energy cooperatives and community groups which set up things. That money is much better spent um, working individually, engaging people and allowing them to take part in it. It changes everything. It yeah. yeah. So um, in true renegade economy style, we have an audience here that I'm sure uh, you, when you've spoken have elicited some thoughts. Um, and who would, who's got a question for Anne? And we've, you've effectively predicted before. Could we challenge you to predict what will happen in 10 years' time? <laughs> and without wishing to skewer your response, could you make it positive so that we're all encouraged <laughs> to go out and spend our money to stimulate the economy? Great question. That's the best question ever. Yeah, really question. Basically, Anne, make it good for us. <laughs> um, do you know that that the authorities in the United States, Eurozone and here, have done absolutely nothing to correct the imbalances in the system, to do anything about the banking system. So we are creating more bubbles. It's not just the housing bubble. There's been a commodity bubble. There are bubbles in all kinds of bond markets. There's bubbles all over the place. They're not the kinds of bubbles that you and I engage in because we buy property. But they're the sorts of com bubbles that speculators are engaged in. And those bubbles are going to burst. And the question then is what impact that's going to have on the rest of us, really. It's the fact that, that nobody is doing anything, really, to fix the system. We've not got Glass-Steagall back. You know, we're not doing anything about restructuring the banks. We're not doing anything about those guys drawing their bonuses, basically. We've let them go on. Now there's been some pain. There's been some suffering in the banking system. But there hasn't been structural change to the system. And that's, you know, that's partly as a result of evil on the one hand and ignorance on the other, I think. So I'm sorry, I don't have a good news story to tell, except that the more we understand it and the more we are begin to ask questions and challenge, the less likely that in 20, 10 years' time there's going to be a crisis. You know, so my hope is that we will have understood it well enough to begin to ask the questions we didn't ask before 2007. And then, you know, then we can make it good. But the positive aspect here is internet enlightenment. Absolutely. Um, the, the, uh, I'm on Twitter, by oh, the way. What's your, <laughs> <laughs> what's your Twitter tag? Uh, at Anne Pesifor, capital A, capital P. Excellent. I, is it case sensitive? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, internet enlightenment, democratization yeah. of knowledge, yeah. and then re-engagement. Yeah. Um, as opposed to this mindset where we constantly think, actually, you know what, I'm too little. It's perverse narcissism, isn't yeah. it? I'm too little, I can't affect anything. No, exactly. And those guys in pinstripe suits, they get it, but of course I can't. You know. But you and, can. But that's why we're reclaiming the bowler hat. <coughs> right. Uh, yeah, and this is yours. Oh, And, and thank you very much for coming in. And, and just let me say, um, just for that um, moment, uh, when you um, got rid of that debt for those countries, uh, in Africa on the Jubilee 2000 campaign. Not alone. Uh, well, I know we're not alone, but uh, you did it with a group of people, but you were absolutely, uh, you know, dogged in your fight, and I'm sure this audience really appreciates that. Thank you so much for coming in. This is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Pettiford. <laughs> so, uh, in celebration of the world slowly becoming less and less left brain and more and more right brain, the renegade economist doodlers have been hard at work throughout the night, uh, let's say, pictorially 
depicting what we have been talking about. The Ritz, of course, the most famous nursing home in the world now. Uh, uh, and who'd have thunk it? There isn't any such thing as society, is it? And uh, uh, this is a handbag, and I think it's the might of Maggie dropping down on a conspiratorial Illuminati-type pyramid with a winking eye. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the renegade economist Doodlers. <laughs> So that's it for this week. Please thank our guests, John Godillo, <laughs> Agamemnon Otero, <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, Albert Moore. <laughs> Join us next week on The Renegade Economist, where we'll have more thinkers, doers, doodlers, and economists talking about how we can reshape the business landscape by changing our actions. Until then, stay curious. <laughs>